it's meet the biz time. Okay, we have, uh, I, I, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say, I love this guy. I think he's amazing. He, I've known him, I don't know for how many years now. And he is, he's an actor, he's an advocate, he's a motivational speaker. He flies planes, he teaches scuba diving. Mr. John Lawson. Hey, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me, David. This is really cool. Oh, this is why well, this keeps me going and, um, you know, hanging out with friends. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, so how have you been? <clears throat> I've been OK, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I have my days. I have my yeah. day um, usually about once a week for about a half an hour. I get very anxious. Yeah. Um, and then once a month for about an hour, I get a little depressed. Yeah. Uh, or more. But then I get through it. I go through it and then move on and focus on what I need to do. And uh, whatever that is to quote, I know this might sound schmaltzy, but make the world a better place. Yeah. By, by bringing joy into into the world. So. I, I agree. I, uh, I, I kind of go through the same thing. And uh, I have actually pretty much been in my house since March. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a backyard and a swimming pool. So I end up going out in the backyard a lot. And uh, I go to Costco about every two weeks for groceries. And uh, I go in the early morning hours when they let the old people and the cripples in. So, you know, I check two boxes. So they don't even check my card anymore. They go, yes, sir, just come right on in, you know. <laughs> You know, but uh, so but that's about it. I did make a quick trip back to Ohio. Um, uh, my daughter got a big promotion with her job and uh, went back to help her pack up and she and her husband and kind of get their house ready to put on the market and uh, felt probably safer flying than I feel in Costco, to be honest with you. Um, I, I've been flying Southwest for 10 or 15 years, uh, ever since I lived back East and would fly out here to do television or film, Southwest always sort of had the best rates and the best deals and the best time when I wanted to fly. So I've been with Southwest for a long time and they're the only airline that is still not selling center seats. So I flew from LAX to, uh, uh Chicago. And there, I had a whole row to myself. There was nobody in the row in front of me, nobody in the row behind me. And across the aisle, the two rows over there were completely empty. So, I mean, it wasn't that full of a flight, but uh, everybody wore masks. And if they kept them down too long, the flight attendants came by and, you know, you could see them. I had my headphones on, but uh, you could see them, you know, asking people to put their masks back on. And it was... Uh, it was really a great flight. Same thing flying back from Cincinnati to LAX. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of went on early morning flights and late night flights. So that probably helped. But uh, but other than that, yeah, it's just been uh, the backyard <laughs> and Costco. Well, it's nice. Nice you have a backyard. What about getting one of those services uh, that will pick up food from Costco for you? Uh, I've thought about it. But you know what? I need that little bit of time uh just to get out of the house on my own and uh you know i have a convertible and i love my convertible and it gives me a few minutes just to i don't live that far from costco but it gives me a few minutes in the early morning hours i can put the top down and let the wind blow through what hair i have left so uh, -huh. uh you know it becomes quite the little zen moment i get some old 60s and 70s uh uh, classic rock playing on there with the top down and pull in the Costco, put on my mask and go get what I need and get out and drive home. So like the meditation to get in that car. And, you know, that's one of the things that I've done over the, this time too, is taken a, a, a friend of mine has made a lemon meringue pie homemade. Yeah. And she lives like four, uh, 40 minutes away. So my trip, drive there, see her for five minutes, social distancing. And then I drive back and just that drive is like, ah, uh, 
Yeah. Well, I, it was interesting. I did make a trip over to Burbank uh, in the very early, uh, maybe March or April. A really good friend of mine lives in Burbank, and you probably know her, Patrika Darbo. Yes. And I called Patrika and said, hey, I'm going to Costco. Do you want anything? And she goes, oh, my gosh, you know, we haven't been out. Roth and I are home. And if you would, if you would um, stop and get me a couple things. So I did, and I, you know, shopped for her and Roth and was driving it over to her house to Burbank. And I live up in Northridge. So I got on the 118 to get over on the 5. And it was so wild. I guess it had been a month or six weeks that, or more that I had not been on the interstate. I had driven on surface roads close to my house, just going to Costco and Northridge and uh, Woodland Hills or wherever. And I had this really, and I've been driving for a long time, moment of anxiety of going, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm on the interstate. Everybody's going 80 miles an hour. I, I, and it took, I mean, I, I regained my composure and I drive fast. I drive like everybody else in LA. I drive like a bat out of hell. And, uh, but there was that moment that I had not been on an interstate for so long that I was almost to the point that I forgot to how to drive on an interstate. And that was such a wild awakening for me. I'm going, okay, I got to get out more. Oh my God. <laughs> so, but yeah, so, but uh, other than that, it's just been, you know, right around town, maybe a quick run to Ralph's and to Costco and that's it. Now, though, when you're in the house for most of the time, you're creating, you're, you're, you're doing stuff. It's been crazy. Uh, back in March, a friend of mine, um, uh, he worked on that TV show, Z Nation, that went five seasons on Sci-Fi Channel. And he goes, you know, I was wondering if you, I want to do a talk show about Z Nation and we'll interview cast and crew and could you help me, would you produce it? And I said, sure. So uh, Zoom was new to everybody, you know, February, March. I went on Zoom and took a lot of training classes and figured out how we could do, uh, use their webinar platform and produce on uh, Zoom. So um, that took off like crazy. Uh, Z Nation is now on Netflix. And uh, we've interviewed everybody from the showrunners, the producers, the executive producers, uh, the cast, all of the cast. We have the lead actress coming up next Friday and uh, Kalita Smith. And um, we have huge people zooming in and asking questions from all over the world now that it's on Netflix. Anywhere Netflix plays, we've had people from Brazil, we've had people from England, Scotland, France, you name it. And um, it, it's just taken off and it's been really wild. And so um, I've been producing a lot, a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And now what uh, do you like more? Do you, do you like prefer producing or acting or directing? What do you, what? I enjoy directing probably the most. I, I love taking just some words on a page and um, bring, seeing, helping people bring it to life, bringing the characters and, and making it, you know, what the writer intended and what their motivation was at the time. But I also do enjoy producing. You know, I enjoy bringing all the elements together and having this great final product. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I can't say a lot about it right now, but I've been asked to produce on a new TV pilot uh, that hopefully starts shooting next year. And actually a couple of different ones, but uh, and I, I can't really say a lot about them right now, but um, yeah, it, uh, it's just opened up a lot of doors and uh, I, been I just finished as a post producer on a film. Um, you know, it had been kind of sitting for about a year and a guy called me through a contact and said, Hey, can you post produce on this and finish it up? And so I did and you know, we did sound and sound effects and you know, color and all the things to finish up the film. And uh, then he goes, don't you produce on Zoom? He goes, can we do like a virtual uh, premiere? And so the other night I produced and directed a virtual premiere 
uh, for cast and crew mostly and some friends. Um, you know, there were a couple of hundred people there and some industry people. And uh, this is more like a, it's a short film. It's a 30 minute short film, but it's almost more like a pilot for a TV show called The Pragmatist. And uh, it's an action adventure kind of thing. And, um, but we had people zooming in and all the cast. And uh, so it was really cool. It went very, very well. And uh, you'll be hearing something about that, I'm sure, before too much longer. They're getting ready to shop it around to networks for a television series. This is great. I think I saw it. It's on IMDb, listed on IMDb? Probably so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's listed on IMDb, but I ended up doing some final edit and I actually did all of the color. Uh, you know, it was just a raw film, just raw data. And so I did, uh, I acted as the colorist as well and colored the whole film. And now I've got, there were a couple of people on that that saw I did the color and now they've contacted me and asked me, well, I color the film for them, that they liked, you know, the way I did it and the way it looked and all this kind of stuff. So the color correction and all of that's a whole new avenue for me that I've really enjoyed. So you're just building on I mean, when did you start like saying, oh, I'm gonna produce, I'm gonna direct? Was it, was it connected with the Disability Film Challenge or was it before then? It was way before then, actually. I produced and directed my first film on film when I was about 14 years old, you know, and a neighbor, uh, did some local stuff years ago when I was a kid and he taught me how to splice. You know, we actually had to cut the film, uh, the old saying of ending up on the cutting room floor and to make scenes put together, we had to cut the film and then glue it back together to make one continuous film. So I think I was shooting on Super 8 and of course no sound. I didn't have any sound or anything like that. But uh, we had a big premiere at my house and my mom and dad set up the projector for me and uh, they were all excited until one of my splices stuck in the film and the film projector and caught on fire. Oh, and no. so, yeah, so my dad was a little pissed, but uh, so yeah, I've, I've done producing and directing uh, since a teenager. And uh, I was a, a voice and piano major in college and drama and uh, still made films back then. And, now, did um, you start making films before you started acting, or did it all go together? It just all came together. Uh, you know, it, I, I always liked uh, acting, and I still do. Of course, now it's fewer and far between with COVID and everything that's going on. I have had a couple of auditions recently uh, for a car commercial and a couple of different commercials. Uh, voiceover and uh, uh, one role in a short film or a, a film feature or something. But um, I've always enjoyed the producing part of it as well. And after I lost my hands over 30 years ago and became more involved in the disability community, I, at the time, I can remember being in the hospital now thinking, well, this is great an actor with no hands that's trained and, you know, has, you know, improv and training and set experience. There'll be tons of work for me. And unfortunately, 70 years later, you know, I mean, you know, uh, here we are 30 years later and it's still not true. So uh, I can remember many years ago watching the TV show China Beach and uh, with Dana Delaney. And Harold Russell, who was a double amputee, did the best years of our lives. And he played her grandfather in an episode. And he was at Thanksgiving or whatever and holding a little styrofoam cup. And he was grabbing the top of the cup by the lip with his hook, just like I do to drink. And I'm going, that guy's really an amputee. He's an actor. And um, so, after the episode, I was actually traveling uh, back from LA. I'd done something, this was years ago, and uh, I was in an airport in Atlanta and watching a TV and Entertainment Tonight was on, I believe it was, and they interviewed him. 
and he talked about his role in the best years of our lives and all that. And uh, so I went home and went to uh, you know, a, a video rental place, you know, what they used to be, got the VHS tape and popped it in, you know, and uh, watched the movie and had no idea that it existed or who he was. So my wife at the time, I, I, I told her, I go, I, I need to talk to him. She goes, well, let's call him. And in the interview with Entertainment Tonight, he said he lived in Hyannisport, Mass. So back then you could dial the area code, and I mean dial, um, on a rotary phone. Yeah. And uh, so I dialed the area code, and you dial 555-1212, and you get information for that area. So I asked for the number of Mr. Harold Russell, and he was listed. And uh, so I got the number, and we, had, we were eating dinner, and I told my wife, I go, I can't call him. He's a movie star. You know, I mean, he, he won't talk to me. She goes, well, just dial the number. If he goes, you know, don't bother me, we don't call anymore. So after dinner, picked up the phone, dialed the number. And he answered the phone. He goes, hello. I go, Mr. Russell? He goes, yes. I go, Mr. Harold Russell? He goes, yes. I go, the movie star! <laughs> Just like that. And, you know, I've never been, you know, impressed by, by people before because I've been in the industry for so long and met so many wonderful people and friends. And, but he just laughed like crazy, this big old belly laugh. And I quickly gave him my spiel that I was a recent double amputee had just lost both hands and I'd always been an actor and I was so excited to get started back and try to do some more acting. And over the years, we became really good friends and talked a lot and there was actually going to be a remake of The Best Years of Our Lives. Uh, and Harold recommended me for the role and I did some screen testing and all this kind of stuff. and. The director and producers were all, you know, wanted me for it, but then uh, I guess funding fell through or something, I don't know, financing, and so it never got made. But it was going to be sort of updated to the Vietnam era, and I was going to be uh, um, uh, double amputee from Vietnam. But almost the same story, but it was sort of an updated remake of the best years of our lives, so... Uh, cool is that? Yeah, and then Harold and I became good friends. We talked on the phone all the time, and his wife got sick, and my wife got sick, and we, uh, you know, talked a lot before he passed away. Wow, what a story! What, <laughs> one of those life stories that are just <laughs> yeah, you just never know. And uh, like I said, when, when I said the movie star, he just laughed. He goes, I don't know about that, you know. Ah. He actually worked as the president. He worked for like four administrations as the president's advisor on hiring the handicap. Okay. From like the late 1940s or 50s on up until in the late 60s or 70s, I think. Uh, but he worked for all the different administrations through those years. So, but he was a really cool guy. Definitely a Navy guy with a sailor vocabulary. Uh, we'll, we'll put it that way. Oh my gosh. I, you know, I was researching you and it's so fun doing the Meet the Business because of course I know some of your work. I mean, one of, one of my favorite movies of yours is the, um, is that wonderful movie G and Dragon? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely adore it, and I know you've done so many ones, Whitney's Wedding, and I love that one too. But something about G and the Dragon, just I can watch that over and over, and just so uplifting. And well, so, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, an, another interesting story is that um, I had originally cast a little girl to be in that. And about two weeks or three weeks before we were supposed to start shooting, maybe a little further out, a month or so, her parents emailed me and said, you know, we totally forgot that we're going back east for a wedding and so she won't be here. So I didn't have anybody for my lead role. I'd already talked to Parvish. How, how close was it to the shoot? About a month out, maybe, you know, maybe somewhere along in there. And they, they go, we're so sorry. 
and uh, I had located, she was with Gail, and anyway, so Gail goes, well, I don't have anybody else that I can think of, you know, that was smaller, younger, I wanted a younger, a younger girl wheelchair user. So I went to the Abilities Expo at the LA Convention Center, because my friend Toby was, you know, working with one of the van companies or something, whatever. So my friend Adam, my DP, and I just went to go support him and the other people that were there. And as we're leaving, this little girl, Gia, of course, I didn't know her at the time, comes rolling by almost over my toe, headed out the door, like by herself. And I'm going, where are her parents? You know, this little kid's going out the door of the convention, you know, out of the, off the floor. And, you know, I, I'm looking around and... I, she was so cute, and I went, hey, how are you? And she goes, hi, how are you? And just kept right on rolling by, you know. And it was so adorable, and I turned to Adam, and I said, that's the kid I want in my movie. And I'm going, where are her parents? And finally, I saw her dad. He was sort of, you know, looking at his phone, but he was watching her, but giving her some space, you know. And, and uh, he was keeping an eye, and I go, I, I need to go talk. That must be her dad. And Adam goes, you can't go talk to him and tell him you want to put his daughter in a movie. And I go, sure I can, you know. So uh, I walked up, explained who I was, and told him I was doing the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. And uh, I saw his daughter, and she would be perfect for this role, for this film that I was planning. And um, he goes, well, his mom's an actress. She would love it. Go talk to her. So he introduced me to his wife. And uh, we became good friends, family friends, and that's how I met Gia. And how, and at the time she did the film, she was not four years old. I think she was only three and a half, almost four. It was like four or five months before her fourth birthday. Yeah. And uh, Parvish Chenna, Par Parvish Chenna is a good friend, and I had asked him to be in the film, and so. Anyway, it, it all came about and all came together. And what was interesting, because of the previous film I did, I had um, CNN uh, did a story, and um, Diane, Diana Jordan, myself, went on CNN, and, uh, and Nick Novicki, yeah. and uh, did some interviews and stuff. So CNN asked, could they send a reporter to follow me and my film crew making the film that year with Gia and Dragon. So, um, the, the long story short, Adam was supposed to work on another film, and it didn't come about. He goes, do you want some help? And I go, sure. Well, my original DP that was working, so I had camera A and camera B units, plus I had the CNN camera crew there, plus... Easter Seals had their videographer there oh, oh, to it. film me with CNN filming us. So uh, knowing that CNN was going to be there and run this and air it on CNN, I not only wanted to show disability in front of the camera with Gia and everyone else, but disability behind the camera, besides myself being a director with a disability. Right. So I called up Kaylee Versfeld who's been in a couple of my films, and, and Shell and her mom. And I said, I was wondering if Kaylee would like to work behind the camera for me on this film, because she'd been in the film previous, and, um, and told her why. I said, you know, I would like for her to work the slate, you know, to slate, because I know that's an iconic picture that CNN will show, yeah. you know, as we're getting ready to start. And she goes, yeah, I think that'd be great. And Kaylee loved it, and she did a great job. And uh, so she's worked on a couple of other films in front of and behind the camera for me. So we had quite the crew with disability as well because I wanted CNN's piece to see that disability not only can be in front of the camera but behind the camera as well. So that was a really good shoot. Of course, we shot it all in one day and, uh, you know, edited and, uh, it's been around the world in, I don't know, 50, 60 different festivals all around the world. So, wow. so it's a really cool film. It's interesting, too. It's such a lesson to directors um, and 
anybody in the arts of how to really look at the whole what's going on. Okay, there you have the CNN cameras, you have these cameras, the Easter seals. This is what we got to do. And you, you know exactly. So you, in a way, directed the whole thing. Yeah. By having her do Slate. And so right. That was just... Because I knew that'd be the iconic shot. And sure enough, they showed some scenes as we were shooting with the camera guy, me behind the camera and all that stuff. But the iconic shot was Kaylee in front slating. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, it was quite the set that we had with all these different camera crews going at the same time. And I had a, uh, from being in the industry for so long, I've had, uh, I think Jason Brown, uh, who uh, is an uh, Ohio friend, but is a, a big time first AD. I mean, you look him up and he's worked on probably a hundred different television shows as a first AD, you know, running on the show. Uh, Drunk History was one of the last ones he worked on. Oh my God. And he's been the first AD on that, I think, since the beginning. And we're good friends. And I'd ask him, hey, will you come be my first AD and run set? Because this is all going to be going on. And just a wonderful guy who kept us right on what we needed to done. So we got all the shots that we needed and awesome. stayed true to the script and got all of our turnaround. So I was very lucky to have somebody with a lot of experience who was one of the most wonderful humans on set. And actually, Jason worked on the pilot of Speechless. And uh, he called me because he knows of my disability advocacy and said, John, well, I'm working on this pilot. You've got to be here. I've, I've got to get you on set. And so Anyway, he talked to the second AD. So I went and worked background on Speechless uh, for their pilot, which I actually didn't get in the shot. The way they ended up cutting it was all tight. But it was where he was going to meet uh, his first person that was going to be his vocal. But anyway, uh, it was so cool. They set me up just specifically to be in the shot, but then they uh, ended up using a closer shot. But so it was kind of cool. I got to meet, uh, sorry about that. No, that's okay. I got to meet, uh, how do I turn this thing off? I thought I did. I usually throw mine against the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's what I should have done. I thought I had it off. I apologize. No, that's okay. Mine does that too. I did it with Dee Wallace and she was like, rule number one. Dee. Yeah. You forgot to tell me, make sure you turn off all cell phones and any device that makes a noise. <clears throat> anyway, so there, you know, I got to meet Micah Fowler and uh, he, a couple of years later, you know, a few years later, we were doing the next disability film challenge and he and I were at an event and he came up to me, he goes, are you doing a film this year? And I go, yeah, yeah. He goes, can I be in it? I said, sure, I'll take a lead actor with an ABC hit TV show to be in my disability film challenge. And so Micah uh, came in and uh, of course, uh, Connor Haney did a great script. And uh, we did this uh, sci-fi, you know, where his wheelchair could make him go back in time. And my good friend, Patrika Darbo, it was that cast came together the same way. Patrika called me and she goes, are you doing a film this year? Can I be in it? I go, sure, I'll take a multiple Emmy winning actress to be in my little short film. So we cast Patrika and, you know, it just, it turned out to be one of the greatest little comedy films that, I, that I've done in a long time. Oh, yeah, it was, and with Miss Brewer in it. Oh yeah, and of course I had to bring Jamie. Jamie's, you know, did my first film years ago, Whitney's Wedding, and, you know, that film, went around the world. I think it was in close to a hundred film festivals. Exactly. It won best international film in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and uh, we got I, to go to Australia. I have a question about getting it out there because for example, a lot of, a lot of the students of performing arts studio West and meet the biz have, have submitted films. And this was the first year that I actually produced a film for the, for, uh, for a disability film challenge. Right. Uh, Honey Bunny. Yeah, so, yeah. So now we have this film. How Which I watched a couple of times. I, I just want you to know. You. It, 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 it was, of course, because of you. Nothing to do with the actors that were in there that 
I happen to know very well. Um, of course, of course, yeah, right, <laughs> but, uh, right, and, the, and everybody else involved. Here's the thing, so you've got a film, you've got a short film, how did you get that to 100 festivals? It's, um, it's expensive. Um, when so I first started with, yeah, when I, when I, to, to, to submit, yeah. uh, when I first started with Whitney's Wedding, I started with the festivals that were free or under 10 bucks. And that um, either had something about disability or love or, you know, something that was close to the theme of what our film was about. And then that produced, you know, six, eight little festivals and we submitted them all. So then I went up a little higher and higher, you know, dollar range. But probably for Whitney's wedding, I probably spent $2,000, if not more, just in film submissions. Yeah. And, you know, you get those letters where, hey, thanks for submitting to our film, but we regret to inform you that we were unable. It was a great film and we really liked it, you know, but we keep your $50. So um, a little, then with my next films, I got a little more... Um, a little more specialized in what I was submitting to. Yeah. And um, this last year, we took second date uh, with Micah to the Cambria uh, Film Festival just up the road. It's a beautiful festival and uh, we won some awards there as well. So um, uh, my first film for Disability Film Challenge was seven or eight years ago yeah. that I shot in Ohio. I, I was, yeah, I shot it back in Ohio and I star, I was in the film. A friend of mine wrote it. Um, now, were and, you now, when did you move to LA? Well, I've lived here part time, you know, half the year or whatever for 10 or 12 years. Uh, and then when my daughter graduated high school, I would come out and spend the winter. I would, I would winter in Hollywood and summer in Ohio. Uh, mainly because I still had a house there. And uh, then the housing market crashed. And so I stuck around for a while, you know, traveling back and forth and would live out here from pilot season to, you know, the March or April and then go back to Ohio. And then about mm, five or six years ago now, maybe, I sold my house back there and moved out here full time. So I've been out full time for six or seven years, five, six, seven years. And in that time, you've been in, uh, what, Westworld, American yeah. Horror Story, yeah. uh, Law and Order, Law and Order Special Victims Unit as an actor. Yes. I did, uh, I have done one episode of Westworld in every season. <gasps> and uh, I, it started three or four years ago. Is it same character, different characters? Different characters, different characters. Uh, always a double amputee. And I can't remember if it was Central Casting or one of the background casting companies knew me or looked me up. I don't know how they found me, but said, would you work background on Westworld? I go, what's Westworld? <laughs> this was quite a long time ago. And... Uh, so I kind of tried to look it up and found out. I said, oh, yeah, I remember the film and all that kind of stuff. It was kind of cool. And so uh, I went on and I, they paid me very, very well. I said, look, I, I'm not going to work for background. But, so anyway, but I got paid very well and uh, ended up doing a couple of days in the very first season. Um, I played a Confederate soldier or something that got blown up. I, I don't remember, but I was in with the main actors uh, in a scene. And I thought that was fun, you know. And then they, like two years later, they called me back and said, hey, the director that directed the first one would like you in this new season. Can you come in? So I go, sure. So I went back in and worked a couple of days again, background. I don't even remember what I played that time. <laughs> uh, and then this last season, again, uh, same people called me back again and going, hey, they want you. And it was the exact same director again. He recognized me. 
I guess because I didn't have arms. But he goes, oh my God, I'm so glad to see you back. I don't think he remembered my name. But uh, I think, is it is the last season playing now? Their third season or whatever? I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, I played, I, I guess I can say, I, I played a knight. Uh, like it was Knights of the Round Table kind of thing. So I, I played a knight. And the director afterwards, and I've forgotten his name, came up to me afterwards and he goes, I am so sorry, he goes, we had this big scene planned for me to be a homage to the, um, uh, uh, the, the knight that gets nailed to the door and his long, his arms fell off and it's going to be, oh, this is going to be a bad day or something like that. What's the show? Oh, uh, uh, the, the comedy. Um... Yeah. I, I've seen it on Broadway and I've seen the film and I, I can't remember it right now, but I was going to be the Black Knight. And, and from like every sperm is sacred. The, the, yeah. The, the... And, you know, he's, he's on the door Monty of the Python. Monty Python. And so he, um, but the wardrobe people forgot to bring the costume. They had this whole costume for me and everything. So I just played one of the robots that was missing arms in one of the rooms or whatever. So, uh, but it was kind of cool. I've done one episode of Westworld for three years, all three seasons. Well, we got to find out what he's doing next, right? Great... Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope they call, you know, because the thing about it is, is it has to be one of the most expensive shows to produce that HBO produces or whoever it's on because, you know, we would go 12, you know, we'd be on set and my scene would get ready to come up and they go, okay, let's break for lunch. So then they'd go back and it would work overtime. And oh, I played a, I played a soldier one time when they blew up the Ford or something. That was the other one. And I was just laying there on a cot and ended up, you know, getting like 16, 18 hour day. We're laying there. <laughs> and, yeah, just for laying there at almost triple scale. So, you know, it was it was amazing. So it's been very good to me and helped paid the rent. So uh, I'm, I'm waiting for season four of Westworld and hopefully one day I get a speaking role and then I can actually get some residuals. <laughs> now, I have to ask about, I was saying to uh, one of my favorite shows is American Horror Story, except right now we're living it, so I don't know. Right, yeah. But, <laughs> but the show, the actual show, you were on that. What, what, how was working with Ryan Murphy and that, that magic? It was, it was pretty cool. Um, I can't remember how I got the audition, to be honest with you, but they wanted a double amputee. And there's not that many around in Hollywood, for sure. And uh, I auditioned. I sent in a tape, I think, because I was back in Ohio. I was back in Cincinnati. And uh, they wanted me to come in for a callback <laughs> in New Orleans. And I went, okay, what the heck? It's, you know, I, I, I drove to New Orleans from Cincinnati and did the call back and the casting director goes, Ryan wants you, I'm glad you came in, whatever. Um, are you available such and such a dates? And they hired me right then. I mean, it was almost not a call back. It was just like, come in, meet Ryan. And you know, he just kind of came in, I did my thing and, and then he left cause they were shooting. And um, so she goes, he wants you can you stick around for a little bit and sign the paper? And I'm going, sure. I was just going down Bourbon Street. <laughs> so I spent two or three days in New Orleans just as a vacation, got the job, drove back to Cincinnati, and they were shooting. It got delayed, and it was like right before Thanksgiving when they were shooting. And uh, I had two scenes. And so they brought me down and uh, put me up in the hotel and all that. And um, the day before Thanksgiving, or what, two days, whatever it was, we were shooting my scene. And, you know, it was kind of going late and all this kind of stuff. We, we, it was interiors with Jessica Lang and Naomi Grossman and 
all the interior scenes that we shot there on set at in New Orleans. And um, I go, well, they'll never bring me back for this little second scene. And it was when uh, Pepper got married. It was during the marriage scene. So I went back and I'm going, that was a lot of fun. You know, I enjoyed that. And a week or two later after Thanksgiving, I call, Ryan wants you back on set. Can you be here? And I go, yeah, I'll free up my schedule. <laughs> so I went back to New Orleans and I actually drove back again. They said, we'll fly you down. You know, they were going to fly me down. I go, do you mind if I drive? Because a friend of mine went with me and we spent three or four days in New Orleans having a great time, How you know. Uh, it was about 11 hours. Okay. So I had my Prius at the time. So, you know, we drove back down and uh, uh, Gabby, my good friend, was on set and sort of became my on set PA, you know. Nobody would argue with me. I'm going, she holds my arms, you know. So... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we had a great time. And of course I got to meet all the cast and got to be a lot of good friends with them. And, um, just, you know, I, I've made some friends just from those two occasions in American Horror Story that are still friends. And of course I knew Jamie, I, Jamie wasn't on set when I was there, I don't think, but you know, I, I met Erica and Matt and just uh, uh, Naomi and, and we just got to all got to be really good friends. It was kind of cool. I just love hearing your stories of how you connect to people. Yeah. Uh, and how you just, you know, whether producing, acting, directing, um, what is your, God, you know, I, I have a list of stuff for you that I could talk to you for hours. We could like do a whole, you know, one episode a week with you, just with you. Uh, my gosh. One thing that I have to bring up is I saw that you do musicals and it looks like you've done every musical you've done South Pacific, you've done Oliver. <laughs> what, if you had to say, I mean, and such, I mean, you're a singer. So yeah. what is your favorite musical and why? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. A musical I'd always wanted to do was Footloose. And I got a chance to do it with the Palm Theater in Palm Springs about four or five years ago. And it was really great. And I got to play the preacher, you know. And I used my cosmetic hands. They said I didn't have to. I go, well, you know, I'd rather, I don't want people to focus on a preacher standing with hooks. And of all, I mean, I've done tons of musicals and that's where my strong lies. But that was probably my favorite because the preacher out of all the characters in Footloose is the only character that changes from beginning to end. He's the only one that has a character arc that changes. Everybody else is the same. They're all Footloose and dancing and doing everything. And the preacher is the only one. The dad is the only one that really changes. So it gave a great character arc and I'd been wanting to do it since college and never had a chance. And I, the first, probably next would be uh, Oliver. And I got to play Fagan. Yes. And that was uh, right after, uh, I, soon after I'd lost my hands. And so it was my, one of my first times back on stage playing a character and I used my fake hands. So. Now, I, talking about that as well, I was looking at your resume as well, which I, I'm used to whenever I, I do casting, you know, boom, boom, boom. Uh, or your resume at the end of what you do, number one, I love hand-to-hand -hand stage combat. Yeah. And then you do over 101 amputee jokes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I mean, and, and then listen to this, what you do. I mean, if I did half of, if I do, I wish I could do, I mean, fishing, ice skating, you're a pilot, you fly, uh, scuba diving, you train, you, you teach that snorkeling, snow skiing, ballroom dancing. Think about all these things that, you know, this is what gets you in the door too. Harmonica, you play the harmonica. You, yeah. I could keep going and the voices you do, it's, it's just incredible. Well, thank you. You know, you you really do, in the industry, have to have a wide range. And when you are a person with a disability, you have to even have a wider range. 
and you know crossing all inner you know all spectrums and one of the things on set that a lot of people you'll, you'll hear thrown around a lot of time is you know <laughs> we have a problem we'll think outside the box and you hear that either in business or in film industry and people with disabilities in daily life think of outside the box every day you know i look at picking up a pencil and i have to think okay how do i have to position my hook so i can pick up the pencil or the pen to have it ready so i can write something down or whatever it's going to be i'm at a a, a buffet at, okay on set you know how i'm used to you don't have buffets anymore but you know how am i going to hold this flimsy paper plate so i can get food and eat and be ready to go back on set and not embarrass myself in front of everybody so you have to think outside the box all the time so as an advocate for people with disabilities in front of and behind the camera you know that's what i preach is that you can hire somebody that thinks out of the set just in daily life and when it comes to things on set that need an instant solution or a quick solution because you're always time is money you know a person with a disability is going to probably have the best idea that you can come up with so you know it it, it even comes down to accessibility you know there's a there's a famous cartoon it's been around a lot where there is a, a man shoveling snow mm. and he's shoveling snow off the steps and there's a guy a wheelchair user there and there's a ramp right next to it that's covered in snow and the caption is you know if you clear the ramp we all can use it if you just clear the steps i can't or something to that effect and that's so true accessibility issues that might make a film set accessible for people with disabilities whether it be a ramp or whatever is also makes it easier for people that have two good legs so when you think about accessibility in those terms you know it, it's not something special that you have to do for an actor or a crew person with a disability so uh it's something that can make it beneficial and easier for everybody one more question what to you is your biggest the biggest accomplishment in life wow you know i'd have to say my biggest accomplishment in life is raising two great kids you know and this recent stuff on facebook daughter day sunday and my son has two children and uh he works from home he's a computer nerd and works from home in programming and works for the uh, uh power industry uh duke power or uh back in cincinnati uh, duke energy and but he still you know he has a a three-year-old almost four-year-old little daughter and you know he and his wife take turns but you know he gets up in the morning and braids her hair and gets her ready for school and now they have a son lucas who's uh uh you know in in pre uh, I, lucas is almost a year or just over a year old no he's older than that he's almost two i guess i better get my ages right but uh you know that's the best in the world and recently seeing things that I taught my children when I was back there recently that my son is teaching his kids and passing on to them. And then my daughter, when she was two years old, my wife was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. And then she passed away in 2001 when my daughter was nine years old. So I was a single parent, you know. And uh, so I get texts from my daughter when she was working on her house and they were restaining the floor. She goes, Dad, this stain says, I've got to put it on, let it wait 10 minutes and then wipe it off. Should I do it with a towel? And I'm going, you're staining a floor and it was a dark stain. I said, just use a roller. And she was going to brush it on with a little three inch brush. And I said, just use a roller, roll it on. 
you know, and then let it dry, let it soak in. And she goes, I never thought about that. And then three days later, I get a text from her and she's packing stuff up and she goes, I'm trying to figure out what I should take and move to Florida and what I should keep. Should I keep these old bridesmaids dresses or should I pack those as well? So, you know, it's so cool to have such a close relationship with my daughter that asks me fashion questions, ask me home repair questions. But then with my son raising his children, and he's the same way. He, he was seven years old when I lost my hands. So he became my hands almost his whole life. So I've always liked to do home repair and woodworking. So the woodworking and the home repair and stuff he learned as a child, he now does in his homes. And he has three or four rental homes and they work on them and, you know, do that kind of stuff. So that to me is my greatest accomplishment and nothing in the world will ever top that. And to know that they were raised accepting of everybody. My kids um, have being raised in the industry around a lot of different people of all races and all abilities and all sexual orientations, you know, they accept everybody. And that is probably the greatest accomplishment that I made some great humans. Sounds like it. So that to me, Nothing on an IMDb or nothing on a resume can ever compete with that. Damn you, David. <laughs> <laughs>